rougeradio.com. Jen talking CFL Week 18 with Peter James, sports media editor with Post Media News. Hello, how's it going? Not bad. So Week 18, one more week left in the regular season, but yet, as always, it, this, this CFL season has the ability to throw curveballs at us. Yeah, my goodness, from one weekend to the next, you can't you can't see what's coming. I mean, uh, heading to this week, who would have thought that the, the two worst teams in the in the league would uh, win games against teams that are going to the playoffs? And uh, uh, you know, Calgary winning in Montreal too. It was, it was it was pretty wild. It was a pretty wild weekend. Uh, the first game, the Toronto Argonauts won. It, it seems like neither the Toronto Argonauts nor the Saskatchewan Roughriders really want that number one pick. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing with the CFL too is that the, the draft is is um, such a crapshoot compared to you know even other drafts, and you know you don't get to retain the players for a long time. So I, I don't think that there's really like the the suck for luck like there is going on in the NFL uh, between those two teams. I mean, with contracts not being guaranteed, these guys have to fight for jobs every week. So I'm not surprised the Argos came out and played hard. And I mean, given uh, the Bombers' track record against. Uh, the Riders and the Argos this year is probably not a surprise that they uh, couldn't get up for the game either. Um, I had expected the game to be close in my CFL picks column this week. I actually did take the Argos uh, against the spread. They were bombed for favored by eight this week. Uh, I didn't ex- necessarily expect <laughs> Toronto an outright like they did, but uh, I wasn't surprised they put up a close game. Swagger ball not all that full of swagger right at the moment. <laughs> You know, I actually didn't think the um, the Bombers played that bad throughout. Uh, really, it was a game that they could have won. Their defense played uh, as well as, as it uh, has all year. I mean, sure, Toronto scored 24 uh, second-quarter points, but, I mean, one was um, uh, just a terrible decision by Buck Pierce on, on the uh, Parker interception, and then another one was set up by um, a long uh, special teams play. Uh, so the Argos were working with, with short fields. And in the second half, uh, the Bombers' defense um, allowed just three points. Uh, Winnipeg's problem all year has been on offense, and, uh, I mean, that's not going to go away. Uh, I think maybe the most interesting development out of the game was was the play of Alex Brink, uh, who, in limited action this year, has has, has played quite well. And, you know, Buck Pierce is still going to be their guy for the rest of the season, but the, the Bombers in the offseason could be thinking, you know, with Pierce um, a pending free agent that maybe – Brink is their man and not Buck because he's not uh, not reliable. That's true. The Argos quarterbacking situation still doesn't seem completely settled, especially not with that with the injury to Giles on a hit that we haven't heard anything about discipline yet, but I believe it's a foregone conclusion that the league will at least make a statement about it. They have to. I mean, uh, the CFL uh, is not known to suspend players very often, but that's the type of hit that should uh, result in suspension. Uh, Watching it the first time, in in real time, I thought, okay, Giles was a bit late committing to the slide, and, you know, he led led with the head, and it was a a bad hit. But uh, watching the replay, you know, the way Sears actually put his head down uh, into Giles' head and and drove his head into the the turf, uh, you know, that that was a very dirty play. And, if you know, at the very least, there should be a a fine. uh, But that is something that should result in suspension. Uh, Although, I mean, given the the league's history with appeals and so on, I mean, there's no way that Sears would serve that suspension this season anyway. But... uh, it, that was uh, as bad as you can see in, in terms of um, intent to injure, I think. And it, and it's dangerous for the person do, throwing the hit, too. One of the reasons that I've always been told that helmet-to-helmet hits are banned is because if you're not seeing what you're hit, your neck is in a very vulnerable position, and you're more likely to break your neck and could be paralyzed. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's I a know, dumb it's move from his party. point of view, too. Yeah, I haven't seen anybody say this before, but I know obviously the Bombers were upset at Quali's hit uh, on Pierce earlier this year that resulted in the in the fine and the ejection. And I'm not sure if there was anything where the Bombers were, you know, going to make an effort to, uh, you know, get a hit on on Giles as well. Uh, but uh, certainly that, that type of hit isn't uh, the type of thing you want to see in this league. No, and the kind of tit for tat is also not something that I believe the league would want to take lightly. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, uh, some of the players uh, from both sides on Twitter after the game uh, were, were <laughs> threatening future retribution as well. So, I mean, I'm sure that there will be people uh, in both organizations reminding uh, players about 
Twitter protocol and, and what you <laughs> should and shouldn't be saying. For yeah, those who I, didn't didn't read, it was um, uh, it was Robertson and um, uh, Rob Murphy from from Toronto, and I think it was Devon Johnson who was replying from to, to Winnipeg just on Twitter back and forth talking about the hit and 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 whether uh, Johnny Sears should uh, be targeted by the Argos next season. You'd like to say that people tend to have long memories, but the, it, it can be, and it may not be that they have long memories. And I think the fact that both Robertson and uh, Murphy are out, you know, they kind of feel bad when they're. Their job, they're both offensive linemen. Their job is to protect the quarterback. You have to feel, you know, somewhat bad when you're you're injured. You're not out there protecting, and your quarterback takes a hit like that. There has to be this feeling that if I was on the field, it wouldn't have happened. That doesn't excuse what they said, and you know, hopefully they're at the very least going to get a stern talking to about not flying off the handle in on such a public forum. Well, I think Rob Murphy's had that talk before too. So, <laughs> yes, he has, and yet. He still hasn't seemed to learn yet. <laughs> but, you know, it happens. It's an emotional sport. And it's also nice to see players feeling that much concern and protection over a quarterback, uh, a fairly beleaguered quarterback, that is. He's not been the most popular player in Toronto at the moment. So No, he's uh, he, he shows those flashes of brilliance. And in, almost in every game, too, you can see a flash where he's, you know, he gets it, and it was the same thing uh, in Winnipeg last year. But uh, he's, he's unable to be consistent enough to um, to to win games. And that's the problem, and that's a bigger problem considering Toronto's hosting the Grey Cup next year, and for obvious reasons would like to be in it. There's a lot made uh, head into this game. You know, a few different stories um, about how you know the Argos can look at the Bombers and then you know look at Winnipeg last year. Um, being four and fourteen, and then turning things around, and having a chance now to to win the division, um, and, and that's true. I mean, it's the CFL, and anything can happen. And, and the Argos uh, may end up going uh, quarterback shopping in the off season too. Uh, obviously, like I mentioned, the Winnipeg situation could be in flux. I mean, Buck Pierce could be available. I'm not sure if they would want to go that route or not. But uh, also uh, in Calgary, are, are they going to bring both Henry Burris and uh, Drew Tate back next year? Uh, and and would that be an option. I mean, Toronto is probably the team most uh, in need of a, a quarterback, and, and, and there will be uh, probably one or two on the market. Another team with quarterbacking issues, so to say, is the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Another result I totally didn't see coming. Yeah, that one uh, came out of the blue. I mean, Saskatchewan, um, some of the the effort this year has been questioned on that team, both when they were uh, being coached by by Greg Marshall and even in some of the recent games um, uh, under Ken Miller, where it just it seemed like the team just didn't have the the same uh, will that they had, uh, say, last year or or two years ago. Uh, so coming into this game, where where it meant nothing, uh, and where Hamilton was kind of you know tuning up for a playoff game, I, I really expected. Uh, uh, Hamilton to kind of run away with it, and you know the opposite happened in a sense. It did, only scoring three points. Saskatchewan did score a touchdown. <laughs> that, 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 Nineteen to three, there was an awful lot of uh, Chris Milo well, going on there. Well, 108 yard uh, punt is going to put them in the record books, and uh, I mean Saskatchewan. It's actually great, to, uh, you know, for their fans there to have the team uh, who, who had struggled so mightily at uh, Mosaic Stadium this year to, to end the home schedule with uh, with a win too. So I mean, it, it was good in that respect, but it was tough to to get much out of that game because there, since there was nothing on the line, the tactics teams employ are a little bit different. You know, the, the riders go in for it in situations where they might not otherwise have done that and. You know, it, it, these type of games are, are really tough to get a handle on. I, I, I think, um, like you mentioned off the top, quarterbacking um, with the tie Cats is a, a big question mark. Uh, you know, neither uh, Kevin Glenn nor, nor Quentin Porter looked uh, at all ready to, to lead a playoff team. Um, and whether they decide to continue with this quarterback rotation or if they're going to pick one guy for next week. We have no clue who's going to be first in either division. Yeah, it's it, it's really amazing because uh, it could have totally gone the other way this weekend too, right? I mean, the, if the results had gone, if a couple of games had gone different ways, uh, all the excitement of Week 19 would have been sapped because you know the Bombers could have clinched, the the Lions could have clinched, or oh, sorry, the Eskimos could have clinched, and uh, we would have had maybe some interest uh, in the Battle of Alberta to see who was going to get home field advantage for the the first round there, but the opposite happened, and we've got, you know, a five-way tie for first in the league and, um, and you know, uh, three very, very meaningful games 
next week, which is great. Speaking of this battle in the West, there was another great Western battle. The BT Lions and the Edmonton Eskimos. It's an amazing game, um, but a lot of people were very upset because it was blocked out. In, yeah, and that was a uh, an odd decision uh, by the Lions, uh, you know, especially having just kind of generated all this goodwill by having the, the great launch of BC Place a few weeks ago with the you know the, the renovated stadium and then you know packing in fifty thousand fans and and all this. So you, you'd think that um, you'd want to market your product even more. And again, with the team doing so well in the second half of the season and so on, uh, I can see where. Um, the value of blackouts are if you're you're really struggling at the gate, and the Lions certainly didn't draw as well at Empire Field this year as as they'd hoped in the in, in the first half. But uh, in, a, in a situation like this, where you can really show your product, it it seems a little bit short-sighted. It does, and BC Place is considerably larger than Empire Field, and when people bought season tickets, you had to. This was a weird year because they spent half the season in one location, half the season in the other. So. It seems like an odd mood, but it is every um, team in the league's prerogative. If they wish to black out a non sold out game, they may. Obviously, teams and, like and Toronto, other teams have done it in the past, too. A bunch of teams have done it to, uh, over the years. Right. I mean, for a team like Toronto, it doesn't make any sense because then none of their games would ever be on television. <laughs> it, it's sad but true. And, and teams can also, I mean, it's considered up to them. That it's their prerogative to set what they would define as the threshold that it needs to be. I mean, the Lions obviously aren't going to. I mean, they don't even sell 50,000 tickets to every game. I mean, they're not, they don't necessarily need to, to sell out the place every week, but maybe there's a certain number they wanted to get to before they blacked it out that was somewhere below a sellout, but at a level they obviously didn't reach this week. The, the final game of the weekend was almost another advertisement for the no lead is safe. Yeah, <laughs> that, that campaign came out at a great time, by the way. Uh, there, there, there's been, I mean, there was the almost uh, comeback by the Argos a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think that was against Edmonton. Yeah, um, last week. That was, that was the first day I saw the ad. Was It was. was it was the very first day the ad was running. The Edmonton Eskimos obviously saw, oh, look, we're in a commercial. Let's try <laughs> in another one. Even though they were in the wrong end of the first commercial. And, you know, if they had blown the lead to the Argos, would have been at the wrong end to a second commercial, I guess. Exactly. And they had the bad w- press. Did the Winnipeg Montreal game last week too. The great comeback. So uh, yeah, and this was another uh, great finish. And uh, gosh, I don't know how uh, Jamal Richardson dropped that uh, that, that first pass uh, on, um, from Calvillo after making the great catch of the play before. Yeah, exactly. He makes this absolutely phenomenal catch, and then drops the next ball. It's like, wow, really? Were you still replaying the other one in your head? The question is for Montreal: if you're if you're trying to figure out who their most outstanding player candidate is. Who do you pick? Is it Calvillo or is it Richardson? In in my mind, it's Richardson. Um, Calvillo has been more inconsistent this year than he has in the last few years. There were a couple of passes that were just way off. That those are passes that Calvillo in, in the past would have always made. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the specific example. I mean, there was one um, where he was th- throwing across the field, and he was about three yards wide. Uh, of the receiver, and there was a couple others that sailed over people's heads. Um, Richardson has been money for the most part. Obviously, there was a big drop, but um, he's had so many 100-yard games, and, and uh, you know, I, I think he's definitely um, the key cog in their offense this year. Calgary, again, a team that you have multiple most outstanding players, but last year's most outstanding player doesn't play. Yeah, right? uh, <laughs> and, and Drew Tate uh, has been... I, I guess the knocking of Henry Burris, you know, for Stamps fans has always been uh, he can look so great one week and then, you know, throw four interceptions the next. Uh, and even within the same game. Uh, and, and Drew Tate uh, is kind of exhibiting some Henry Burris characteristics as well because he has been uh, great at times. But a couple of his interceptions that he's thrown over the past few weeks have been really poor decisions as well. Uh, so I... I I don't know if he's, you know, Henry Burris light or or, or what, but uh, we've got a really small sample size to look at so far. But he's certainly done enough, uh, you know, to to beat Montreal in Montreal, which is no easy task. No, it's it's very hard to come in and win at McGill Stadium. So to do that, obviously they had something going on offense. Uh, Johnny Cornish seems to have come out of nowhere. It was the Johnny Show <laughs> between Johnny Perzani and Johnny Cornish. You know, he just they couldn't get a break. I mean, each of them had two touchdowns. It, they seem to be playing anything you can do, I can do better. And it, Cornish has been on fire. 
He has, and it's fascinating the, the emergence of the Canadian running back this year. Uh, I mean, um, Dromesum didn't do uh, too much uh, this week, but uh, certainly in the last four or five weeks, he's, he's been uh, uh, a huge force. And, and then uh, Cornish with, with Calgary, uh, the, the same thing, obviously. I mean, if you're winning the job away from Joffrey Reynolds, uh, that, that sure says something because uh, Reynolds has been a fixture in that team for so, for so long. Um and I don't know if this is a, a, a trend in the CFL, if there's going to be some, some more Canadian backs coming through the, the system where um, a position that had been you know, generally dominated by, by imports on, on most teams uh, is now a place where certain teams can, can uh, plug a Canadian and have kind of a ratio breaker there. Definitely a good thing. So for next week, we have some awesome matchups set up now. I mean, the best thing about this week is that it's set up some pure awesomeness for next week. Um, We'll have both the East and the West decided. We have no clue. We know that Hamilton will be on the road. That's all we know. We don't know if they're going to Montreal. We don't know if they're going to Winnipeg. And that would be a fairly big difference in how they prepare, I would assume, for oh, the yeah. two cities. Um, the, the, well, the two teams are so different, too, right? I mean, Montreal's got the potent offense. I mean, and, and their defense isn't, isn't horrible, but the, the Montreal secondary is vulnerable. Winnipeg, on the other hand, you know, can't move the football, but is uh, the, the, the Swaggerville defense that can shut you down. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's totally a totally different game plan for Hamilton depending on, on who they end up facing, although they'll have to be both of them at some point if they want to get to Vancouver. Yeah, uh, and I think, after last, I think after this week's performance, a lot of Ticat fans are wondering just whether or not they will be able to make it to Vancouver. The, the West seems wide open, but, yeah, the East not so much. I mean, you you, you got to figure that it's going to come down to another Winnipeg-Montreal showdown and uh, – Home field advantage uh, for that East final uh, is going to be huge. Uh, you know, going to Winnipeg uh, in late November is not pleasant for anybody. Uh, <laughs> not even for the Winnipeg players, really. <laughs> not even for the Bomber players, no. So, uh, and that crowd, and you know, that would be again the last game at that uh, at that stadium. So, um, the the pressure is really on the Bombers to win in Calgary this week because uh, you know, if they want to get to the Great Cup, I think they have to win this week to get the East final at home. I think they'll have a much harder time uh, going into Montreal to the Big O uh, for a playoff game. Definitely. And they control their fate. If they win, they have a home playoff game. So Montreal needs a little bit of help to have that East final, which is different than it has been in previous years. So we'll see how Montreal, you know, it might be interesting for a CFL fan to find out how it goes. And in the West, every single team theoretically can still hold the Western final. Yeah, Calgary needs the most help. They would need to win and have the other two both lose. Uh, but yeah, a, a, any one of the three uh, can win. BC holds the trump card. If they win, um, no matter what happens to anybody else, they'll host. So they they do. They are like the bombers. They control their own fate. Exactly. Yeah, they won the season series against both Calgary and Edmonton. So they uh, they're they're in a very good position. But they still have to beat Montreal, which is you know they probably drew the, the toughest uh, opponent. So yeah, it, yeah. It, it'll be it'll be fun they, to watch. They may have they may have the control, but. They they have the hardest way to go. The interesting stat that came out of this week, and I think, is that the Riders have not won a single game against Western Division opponents, but have won all their games against, or have won five games, like all five of their games that they've won have been against the Eastern Division. Yeah, and that's that, that's bizarre. You know, I mean, it is. Even for the CFL, where the bizarre happens regularly, that's bizarre. Especially, I mean, you know, in, in recent years, the, the East has been the weaker division. Uh, but this year, that's not been the case. I mean, the, the two divisions have been fairly equal. I mean, there, there certainly is a slight balance of power to the West if you look at total records and so on. But uh, it's not like the past where you have, you know, two teams in the East that have three wins apiece and, and so on. So, yeah, it's just a, a quirk that Saskatchewan has done so well um, against the East, I think. I, I don't know what to read into that. And I mean, yes, two of those five wins came against the Argos, who were not exactly, but who have the who have, a, have an identical record, so they haven't exactly been doing all that poorly either. No, and they and they each both of those teams have big wins. I mean, uh, Saskatchewan beat Winnipeg twice and beat Montreal, and and uh, Toronto beat Calgary and uh, they beat Winnipeg this week. Uh, yeah, and they, they beat, beat Calgary Win- twice, once in Calgary and once at home, which is. And they beat know, Winnipeg twice, so. Exactly. So the Argos. But can't seem to win the the quote unquote easy games, but give them the hard games and they're good. I, I think, think Winnipeg fans so would be the same thing about their team. Exactly. Can't beat the Argos, but they can go and beat Montreal. It's an interesting. Um, it's going to be an interesting end of the season. There was one record that we would be remiss if we didn't 
mention, Byron Parker, ninth career interception back for a touchdown. Yeah, and it was one of those, uh, you know, in, in the flat there that, uh, you know, the cornerbacks uh, and defensive backs love because uh, it's clear sailing when they pick one of those off. It is, and, I mean, he's got some jets on him. Yeah, oh, for sure. Another yeah. record in Montreal. You're talking exactly. about Richardson? Yes. Yeah, and, and, I mean, that just shows consistency, right, being able to, to continually uh, have game after game over 100 yards. Yeah. Uh, no one seems to have found a way to stop him. Well, he's a tough <laughs> He's a tough matchup, you know. He's a big guy who can run a route, and he's got a quarterback who, uh, uh, despite what I said earlier about having an off year, is you know an off year for Calvillo is still a very good year. Uh, <laughs> an off year for Calvillo is a year that most other quarterbacks in the CFL would long to have. Oh, exactly. So he can get him the ball, and uh, you know, yeah, he's he's a tough matchup. Although Winnipeg did shut him down uh, in that game in in Montreal um, four or five weeks ago, so it has it happened is. once or twice. It is it is possible, but wow. It's uh, not the e- world's easiest task, let's put it like that. And so every, it seems like for the last five weeks, every week, there's been some kind of record broken, which is great for the league and great for the marketing, but you have to think eventually they're, they're going to run out of records. That's true. And, I mean, I guess Gilroy Simon is, is one really big game away from uh, another record. So we could be think... talking another record next week. Yeah, I don't think it'll happen. I think he needs... Uh... Either 180 or 190 or something. Yeah, I think he's very close to 200 yards. So yeah, so it's, it's yeah. very unlikely to happen, but stranger things have happened. It is yeah. the CFL, exactly. um, and the Lions are playing for for their playoff destiny. So if there's any time for Simon to have a big game, it's now. And they're playing against um, a Montreal team that does have a bit of a banged up secondary that is uh, certainly their their weakness. So you never know. It's set up for a great final week of the season. Can't wait to see how everything ends. Thank you so much for talking with us this week. It's been a pleasure. We'll see how everything shakes out.